How to ESSM 406. Today I want to talk to you briefly about some of the market-based approaches that I expect you to be thinking about as you write your papers. Uh, I talked in the lecture about the five P's about market-based approaches. Let's go over again what the advantage of the four different kinds of market-based approaches. They all have similar advantages. The big advantage is that market-based approaches allow people to make their own decisions about how they shift around the costs of environmental compliance or the benefits of environmental compliance. A command and control regulation says you must do this or you cannot do this. A market-based approach provides you an incentive to do the environmentally right thing. But if it's really expensive for you to do that, you can decide that, well, I'm willing to pay. Probably we can set the price through these market-based approaches. We can set a price that will incentivize most people to comply. And oftentimes, if a few people don't comply, we don't care. So if you think about something like uh, pollution, which is a classic example, we probably don't care if there's a tiny bit of pollution. We only care if there's a lot of pollution. So if we make polluting really expensive and some people still pollute, that's not such a big deal as long as most people don't. You can think about the same in terms of water use. Uh, if we raise the cost of water a lot, then it's going to be more expensive to people to water their lawns. And people like me who don't really care about lawns that much are not going to water their lawns. But there's probably some people, I don't know, maybe people who play baseball in their backyard. They really want a lawn so they can play baseball or football or whatever on their back on their lawn. And that's worth a lot to them. So they might be willing to pay for it. And well, now I'm not watering my lawn, so we're saving a lot of water. Only the people who really are willing to pay a lot for it will water. So that's more efficient because, well, we reduce the water a lot. We might reduce it just as much as if we banned watering lawns, because if we banned watering lawns, people might be really upset and they might try to break the rules. So it's really a very good way to do things. There's a couple disadvantages to market-based approaches. One is if you really care about like getting everything cleaned up, then it's hard to do that with a market-based approach. It might be better to ban it. So something like, uh, let's say some really, really toxic chemicals. Probably we should ban those. We probably shouldn't just make them really expensive because they're so toxic that they'd really hurt us. Um, then the second, the second problem with market-based approaches is they can be, although they're not necessarily, very difficult to set up and administer. The classic market-based approach um, that you he hear talked about all the time uh, was the sulfur dioxide emissions controls under the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments signed into law by the first George Bush, George H.W. Bush, the one who has his library here. Uh, these were meant to control acid rain. And uh, actually, there's an interesting cost-benefit analysis story there, which is that uh, they did a cost-benefit analysis and they said, you know, we don't really think these regulations are worth it. Acid rain is bad, but it's not really having that much cost, and this is going to impose a lot of cost on power plants. Well, about five years after it went into effect, they did another cost-benefit analysis, and they found costs were way, 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 way smaller than the benefits. Why? When they did the benefits, they forgot to think about the benefits to human health. And it turns out that acid rain is bad, but sulfur dioxide also has other negative human health implications. It creates local smog around the power plants. And that's really bad for human health. Smog is really bad for your lungs. So the benefits were much bigger. In any case, they went through this big thing and they set up this program. And it would not, it would have been 100% impossible if they had not had a way to monitor how much sulfur dioxide was coming out of every single power plant in the region that was being regulated. So you had to have what's called continuous emissions monitoring. Now that was not available. It didn't exist until about 1985. There was no way to set up a cap and trade 
program until the mid-1980s. Now, it existed, it actually became quite cheap, and it was installed on every uh, coal-fired power plant in, uh, particularly in the Midwest, was the key region. Now, there was one other big disadvantage with the, with the cap-and-trade program that applies to market-based incentives, and that's the problem that there's potentially hot spots. So what's a hot spot? Let's say we want to reduce uh, acid rain. So we're going to put a cap on the amount that can be uh, emitted, right? It's a cap program. Each power plant gets a certain amount of sulfur that it can emit. And they can trade. So I decide, you know, I'm just going to close down my, my power plant. I'm going to sell all my emissions to another power plant. So they can produce two times emissions, and I, I'm not going to produce any emissions. That's the idea behind a cap and trade. Or what actually happened is often they switched to lower sulfur coal. They'd have less emissions, and then the other power plant would have uh, more emissions, and they could buy my emissions. So uh, what happens if we do this, and pretty much everyone you know, is reducing, the overall quantity of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is decreasing, but three big power plants right next to each other are not decreasing. And I just told you, sulfur dioxide has a lot of local negative air quality implications, and it also causes acid rain. So maybe just this one locality, let's say Cincinnati, Ohio, which has really bad air quality because of all the coal-fired power plants near it, uh, might still have a lot of problems, even though you know, overall, we've really reduced our acid rain problems since the early 1990s. But certain areas have these hot spots. Now, if we had a different kind of regulation, that might not be a problem. So that's the overview of the benefits and the costs of using market-based approaches generally. In the next talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about incentive programs, because uh, those tend to come up a lot in this class.